Hello, and welcome to this extended seminar on the status of biotherapeutics in equine and canine medicine. And this seminar, what I aim to do over about 45 minutes to 50 minutes is take you through how, when, and where to use biologics. And that's really what I'm going to be focusing on is just the, the current use of biologics. So really the take home message that I hope you'll get by the end of this uh, seminar is that biologics are not all the same. So what I see in practice is people tending to just get into the habit of using one particular type of biologic. It's to really understand that which biologic to use, what to expect and how it might work in your application of it in a particular pathology. Timing is absolutely critical here because what you're actually doing is understanding that, that etiology timeline, um, attaching it to your understanding of the pathology, how it moves and where you use it. And I can tell you now how you use a biologic because you're either stimulating or modulating an outcome at the point at which you stimulate, you've got to anticipate what the body is doing that particular time and what you are trying to achieve. So um, really timing is something which I want you to really take home as a message to understand. Getting the balance right between catabolic and anabolic and really uh, to, to set the scene, this is where we're trying to stimulate a anabolic. We're trying to stimulate tissue growth. We're trying to stimulate disease modification. And that's very hard to achieve when we're looking at an inflamed, uh, a catabolic environment. So what you'll understand is that uh, you need to potentially use other medication, other therapy, or even the use of a biologic to move it from a catabolic environment into a anabolic status or, or stimulation. So really what I want to say from the get-go is that quite often when using a biologic, it's not just a one injection or one application and that's you done. Um, you've got to have your mind on exactly where this pathology is and what you're trying to achieve at that particular time with that biologic. And also because it's a biologic, it's an autologous preparation for most of the case. So there will be variations because you're dealing with the body's own uh, biology and the application of biology. So if you are manufacturing or culturing or producing one of these biologics, there will be differences in the actual biologic because you're working from a different patient or time. And that then applies to the outcome. So just because it works really well in all your cases, don't think that's going to be the same. So each case is different. Equally, if you've had an experience where it hasn't worked, it isn't necessarily the technology or your application of it. It could be the timing. It could be the status of the patient, the overall health of the patient, and your manufacturing of a biologic from that patient that's led to that outcome. So don't be disappointed. It's certainly not, in most of the cases, your situation or your uh, ability to apply the biologic. Some things are out of our hands when it comes to using biologics. So what I'm going to do is set the scene here. <clears throat> so the use of biologics today and very much where we use them here at Nupsala uh, and in association with the Veterinary Osteoarthritis Alliance is its application in musculoskeletal disease. And um, to set the scene where we're looking at both equine and canine. So for the equine clinicians who are watching this, you understand that um, you know, the disease itself actually manifests itself in the soft tissues first. And because it manifests itself in the soft tissues is it actually affects a greater proportion of the animals that you are uh, having under your care than you may or may not have uh, understood before. So we're looking at this as nearly 20% of adult dogs that suffer from uh, osteoarthritis and an even bigger proportion once they get older. So this is a lifelong lifestyle disease. It really comes on early in life sometimes, but is there for the rest of its life. When it comes to the equine joint, really I can say that really most horses in some sort of performance would have a degree of osteoarthritis and that's because we're then looking at the application of a treatment to an acute synovitis. And that's because what drives this disease what starts with a normal joint moving forward to an osteoarthritic joint is how the joint adapts and what changes are occur within that joint. And the point that I want to really uh, bring to your attention is that it's not just a cartilage issue. It's not just a bone remodeling issue. It's very much a soft tissue issue. And I think people overlook as to how affected the soft tissue is in this disease process. And when I talk about soft tissues, I'm talking about the joint capsule, I'm talking about the synovium, the synovial tissues. And what we need to do is understand how this disease grades. 
And for this particular area of the talk, I'm going to refer to the canine side of things. This does not apply to the equine, although I think as an equine clinician, you could apply similar uh, thought process to what you view on your uh, imaging or your lameness workup as to what status of the pathology the, the patient is in. And what we're trying to do here is understand that this is a progressive disease. And if it's progressive, your treatment strategy at each stage might be different. So this is not a validated uh, grading. This isn't something which has had a huge amount of numbers. All this is is a, a matrix that you can apply to any situation on a degenerative disease. So if you think it's getting worse and affecting more tissues and the amount of tissue that it's affecting is increasing, then we have a progressive uh, uh, scale here. And with that in mind, as it progresses and it starts to damage more tissues, then our strategy and our treatment strategy will obviously have to change because if we don't have that in mind, what we might find is that the patient is non-responsive to that treatment strategy. That's not because the treatment that you're giving is failing, it's because the disease is now progressed into a different stage and you then need to rebalance, reevaluate the overall condition of the joints. It could now be multiple joints, but what you're trying to look at here is the early stage disease, especially in the dog, is actually pretty hard to pick up. There could be absolutely no radiographic findings. So you're looking at sensitivity to the joint, you're looking at uh, perhaps even things like force plate analysis, stance analyzing when you're looking at peak vertical forces, anything that would indicate that that joint's not being loaded, there's a sensitivity going on that joint, especially one that persists and persists over amount of time. So like all these things that we understand uh, with all disease process, if symptoms persist, then we have an issue. So look out for those early stage changes, especially in things like sport dogs, agility dogs, working dogs, any dog that is using its joints more than say a, um, a, a non-working dog. And I think the bit that falls in the middle here is a dog which has a very active owner, an owner who enjoys long runs and uses their dog as a running companion. Um, we're gonna see the same type of uh, cumulative fatigue damage, that wear and tear to a joint, perhaps faster in that type of owner population than, than somebody who just takes it for a gentle walk. But what we try to encourage here is try to get in your practice and your clinical uh, recording is try and give a grade. And that's a way that you can communicate this to the practice at large. So if anybody else is looking at this dog, uh, they can understand that this was actually classified as an OA dog. And also when you start to label this is that we encourage practices to start labeling them right up front. So if this dog is coming back for a, uh, a vaccination or it's coming in for a different type of condition, say it's got a dietary condition or even uh, uh, whatever the, the, the situation might be that it's coming back into uh, the practice for a review, is that it's an OA dog coming back in for an ear infection or for a dental process. And it just gives the practice a time to undertake an, a disease review. This is an ongoing disease. So use the opportunity so obviously if it's coming back in just for a routine health check and routine vaccination, we should be seeing these dogs already coming back for OA uh, examinations a lot more frequently than just an annual checkup. But just in case they miss that net, it gives you opportunity to book an extended uh, consult if they're coming back in for a vaccination. So let's just switch on to soft tissue injuries. And really here we're going to switch to the equine tendon disease. I'm going to flip backwards and forwards between equine and ten, uh, canine because there is some value in, in clinicians who work in equine understanding what's going on in canine and definitely clinicians who are working in, in small animal practice understanding what's going on in, in uh, equine practice. So in equine practice, we are very advanced in, in the diagnosing and understanding of tendon disease. That's not really the case in, in small animal practice. We are start, starting to get a lot more small animal clinicians using ultrasound, diagnosing um, ultrasound uh, uh, lesions within tendons and ligaments, and understanding what part that plays in patient lameness. All too often, we actually see a, a painful tendon or, or ligamentous type injury manifesting itself in a dog loading uh, on another joint, or even that joint itself being affected by the tendon disease, this inflammatory condition, all this sort of change, especially whether it's being uh, a situation where the other joint is loaded or it's compensated by throwing its weight forward or compensated by throwing its weight backwards, whatever the situation, 
understand that tendon ligament injuries initially are very, very painful. Now, flicking back to the equine side of things, we understand the problem with uh, tendon disease. This has been around for a very, very long time, but really just a reminder and advice here is that the SDFT is really the one that we, we associate with, um, with tendon disease. And why? And that's because it breaks down and it's all to do with that cumulative fatigue damage, that strain that occurs. And that strain really comes by horses that are actually galloping. The amount of strain that a tendon would take at gallop, up to 60% strain, but you can actually see tendons breaking down if you were to mechanically test them, a lot less than that. So the actual horse galloping is operating at its absolute peak limit when it comes to how that soft tissue copes with that function. And if we understand the, uh, the high loads, if we look at things like show jumpers or, or eventers, where we've got the increase in speed and the load aspect, so we've got the whole of the body being forced through um, the speed and the acceleration of the load down onto a structure that's very, very small. That's at the mid metacarpal region, that's about 1.1 to 1.2 uh, cubic centimeters in, in, in cross sectional area. And that's a very, very small amount of tissue that's taking a phenomenal amount of load. Um, so we know that it operates close to its functional reality, uh, sorry, its functional limit. And what that does is it brings about that cumulative fatigue. And this is all due to with tendon aging, and that's uh, very much driven by our MMPs, those meta uh, matrix metalloproteases that are breaking down that tissue ever so slowly. So there comes a point that we're not going to get a, a rupture just because it goes bang. It kind of creeps up on you slowly, but surely it creeps up. Um, and this can actually be seen if we look at uh, some work that was published by uh, Charlotte Vella years ago, where we looked at horses in training and the degree of tendonitis with horses in training was nearly 40%. If you were to scan those horses and look at the, the quality of the tendon tissue quite often, all too often, you were seeing a clinical tendonitis in these working horses. And I think that's got to be expected by any horse which is going out training every day, such as a rate horse, uh, accumulating that damage over a period of time. So essentially tendon disease is inevitable. But what do we need to do? We need to really avoid the formation of scar tissue. That's really our clinical strategy uh, in our approach to tendonitis. And that's because normal tendon has this sort of nice, you know, uh, one that always refer to it as sort of strands of spaghetti, nice elongated tendon fibers. Um, but the problem with the, the scar tissue, if we get a breakdown and a lesion, so we get a rupture of tendon fibers, within the actual body of the tendon, it heals with that scar tissue, it heals with that haphazard formation. And that haphazard formation, we often refer to that as, it looks a little bit like cooked spaghetti. So we get the uncooked spaghetti versus the cooked spaghetti. Simplistically, it's not as elastic as its normal tendon tissue. So if we look at all the forces being applied over that tendon, if we've got a, a part of that tendon which is scarred, then essentially what happens is that the healthy tendon has got to pick up the workload of the tendon that is not stretching as much as the healthy tissue on the side. And what we find here, especially if you've got a scar tendon, so all tendons will eventually heal, we know that. If it heals with scar tissue, is that because the healthy tissue now picks up that workload and is working more than its uh, scar tissue or more than healthy tissue that's unscarred, is that we see what's called a transitional ozone injury. So the transition from scar tissue to healthy tissue right there, that junction between the two is where we see the injury. Ironically, we don't see the injuries appearing in the area of scar tissue. It's always that bit of healthy tissue adjacent to that scar tissue. So it then says that horses that, or even dogs, or any patient that has had a tendon injury is now predisposed to more injury because of the lack of function um, of that scar tissue. Our goal is really to um, avoid scar tissue, to decrease the amount of scar tissue formation and move that forward into a better type repair. So the nice thing about the use of biologics was that this really was the driver for the use of biologics. Um, it goes back nearly 19 years ago when uh, the first horses were injected with stem cells was that when we applied regenerative medicine, it was easy because we had the application, we had the injury, it was easy to apply uh, the, the stem cells into the tendon because it created a vessel in which to do so. And over the years, we've seen biologics used for other soft tissue and other musculoskeletal 
uh, diseases, especially where it's uh, sort of a degenerative condition, um, especially where inflammation is a key aspect of it, because quite often where we apply a biologic, it is a, a form of anti-inflammatory. We can control inflammation either by changing the direction of what's going on inside the environment or by stimulating a anabolic uh, repair mechanism, which can then counter that anti-inflammatory or that inflammatory situation. So the therapeutics we're gonna run through are ACS, um, sometimes known as IRAP, but that's autologous condition serum. Uh, we're gonna look at PRP, your platelet-rich plasma or platelet enrichment therapy, uh, bone aspirate concentrate, stem cells, and polyacrylamide. So what we look at here is um, IRAP uh, or ACS, the autologous condition serum. Uh, there's two forms in the market. There is the, uh, what one would refer to as the original IRAP, um, and then there is uh, other versions uh, such as Arthrex in the market. And there are a few papers out on this and understanding how they work. Um, most of those, if you wanted to, um, to search them, it would be uh, Wayne McElroy and Dave Frisbee's papers. Um, Dave's done both of those papers. There's like a paper one and a paper two. Um, both are, are well worth a read to understand how this technology works. So to get your head into essentially what you are trying to achieve here by using ACS in the disease process. So if you look at this chart, I'm going to bring the mouse on here um, and hopefully you can see it on the screen. As interleukin-1 starts to climb its, its inflammatory, its, its deleterious action, um, and what you've got to do is understand what actually happens here. If interleukin-1, which is your main inflammatory cytokine, it's not the only inflammatory cytokine by any stretch of imagination, but it's a dominant one, and it's one that we understand its mechanism. Okay, so as IL-1 actually climbs, and the, the interesting thing here is IL-1 actually has a beneficial role. It, it's also used as a, as a protein, it's a cytokine that controls cell turnover. So essentially what happens is that this, this uh, cytokine is a little bit like a text message. Okay, so it carries a message. It's not actually destructive itself. It carries a destructive message. So what essentially we're looking at within the uh, synodal environment is how IL-1 works with binding, say, with the chondrocyte. So if it were to bind with the cell receptor on the chondrocyte, it will then pass a destructive message through to that cell. And what that cell will do now is it will do three things. It will produce nitric oxide, which will create that, that chondrogenic apoptosis. So here's where you're getting that cell turnover. So we kind of need that mechanism to encourage new cells and obviously deal with a volume of aged cells. So that's your, your body's mechanism, making sure that you've got healthy cell turnover. So you get that production of nitric oxide. The next thing you're going to get is the production of MMPs. So these are our matrix metalloproteases again, in particular 3, 9, and 13. So we understand which MMPs are having a role in the, the drive of, uh, of osteoarthritis within the synovial environment. And what these MMPs are going to do is that they are really uh, deleterious to our soft tissues. So what we're looking at here is although they've been released by the cell and they have an action on the, the local tissues within the, uh, the articular surface, but because they're released into the joint, they also have an action on our soft tissues. And what deleterious role they play to the synovial membrane, the synovial tissues, okay? So as that cell increases, you've got uh, cells within the synovial environment, um, mainly the, the, the synovium, are reading the synovial fluid all the time. So they're able to understand the, the status and the health of the synovial environment and they act accordingly. So again, not just the synovial sites, but there are other cells that have the ability to produce the antagonist protein, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein. So as IL-1 starts to elevate, you have a situation where you have a, almost a retrospective balance of the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-1-RA, that antagonist protein IL-1-RA. And what that does is it blocks the cell receptor, thus denying uh, the IL-1 ability to bind and administer its, its, uh, its deleterious message. Um, and this is a whole cycle of events. So what you've got is the third thing that will happen is uh, when IL-1 binds with cytokine is you get a production prostaglandin again. So here we have that inflammatory cycle coming back around again, a full 360, and that takes 14 days. 
So from its peak, we see here, it'll be another 14 days till the peak of its catabolic action, okay? So it's all the time, it's ongoing. There's a kind of a, a level of uh, how IL-1 is, is within the joint, but I'm just talking about how its action kind of waves through uh, the, uh, the, the timeline here. So what we have then is a natural balance between IL-1 and IL-1RA. But the issue is that you've got a catabolic event before you have a balance effect. So if we were to have a situation where through trauma, say excessive training, um, repeat um, uh, factors which would accelerate disease or inf accelerate um, inflammation within the joint. So we're looking at, say, peak periods where we're increasing speed um, over long durations. You know, if we look at, say, um, endurance horses, you know, we've got factors here that we know are going to accelerate trauma within the joint. Obviously, direct trauma is going to be an issue when it comes to inflammation. And again, uh, without a doubt, infection, but not touching on, on infection joints. Um, so really what I'm looking at is day to day uh, problems within the joint. And, and essentially, if you can understand that this would happen first, so anything that we do to accelerate um, IL-1 through excessive training, excessive uh, factors that would accelerate that, then we've got an acceleration of our, our deleterious, our catabolic factors, okay, especially MMPs, which are then balanced. But the problem that you've got is that during this period of time here, before we get the balance kicking in, is that that deleterious effect is against our soft tissues. And the main production of that antagonist protein is the synovial tissues. You've got two types of cell within the, um, uh, the, the synovial uh, membrane, especially when looking at the intima layer. Uh, they're both fibroblasts. You've got the alpha and beta uh, fibroblasts within the intima. And it's that beta um, uh, uh, cell which is responsible for the production of everything we need as far as synovial fluid. We need um, obviously, um, uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines, and, and really the health of the synovial fluid is derived from those cells. And unfortunately, that intima layer is the one that gets hit first when it comes to the overproduction of those deleterious factors released by the chondrocyte in response to IL-1. And really, it's because those cells become damaged and taken away that we start to see a decrease in that production. So the, the joint actually starts to remove or reduce its ability to counteract an increase in IL-1. And that's the driver in the disease. And this is where we start to get the early onset in the disease. So if we don't get a retrospective balance, a pull down of IL-1, we then get an artificial, in a sense, elevation of the catabolic effect. And this is where we start to get physics and biology coming in together is that wave just starts to increase and increase as time goes on. So your strategy here is to essentially either stop it, yeah, which is why corticosteroids work really well because we can just block prostaglandin, especially in a joint where it can work up to 96% for 56 days um, if you know, a particular corticosteroid. Um, so that is a strategy, absolutely, when we're looking at this, but that's only temporary. We have to understand that we've got damaged tissue and really what we're going to try and do is restore its autogenous way of dealing with this imbalance. So that's the, the, the basic principle. Uh, there's a really good paper here, the role of synovitis and osteoarthritis pathogenesis. And that's really going to go into more in depth of what I've just told you about. If you can understand that, I can tell you now, this is really going to influence how you approach this disease. Understand the timelines, understand how you're looking at a lameness that may be worse one day than the others. Is this because we're in the middle of a wave cycle? Um, the way that you're applying your, your strategy or the results that you're getting. Try to understand and take a step back and think about what's going on inside the joint. Okay. So the indications for ACS, this really comes down to um, what the manufacturers of the ACS are trying to say. What I would say is use it as a, a natural form of anti-inflammatory. And what ACS does is it actually manufactures the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein. I will caveat that by saying that we know that there are other mechanisms to ACS, and that's not for this lecture. Uh, there's some really good work um, out of uh, Edinburgh University um, looking at how ACS or components of ACS or even the, uh, the influence of microRNA 
is having within the joint. So that takes it to a whole different level of understanding. So, but at this level, and I think it's fair to say, if you're applying ACS, look upon it this way. And it's a very broad, in a sense, crude way of trying to apply this technology and understanding that you're just trying to produce more antagonist protein to block the inflammatory cytokines. So think of it as a natural uh, biology. <clears throat> um, it's worthwhile just putting a slide up to show um, the difference between ACS and ACP. Um, this is autologous conditioned serum versus autologous conditioned plasma. Um, autologous conditioned serum is that what you've done here is that you've created a clot um, and what you've got is you're stressing the clot, you're actually stressing the leukocyte and it's that leukocyte that produces that protein when you incubate it for um, uh, several hours at, uh, at 37 degrees. Um, and the, what you get out of that is it's demonstrated here, the autologous conditioned plasma versus the autologous conditioned serum. Okay, so the, the serum is what you're after. So um, if you look at the chart here, there's a, 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 a quite a significant difference between the amount of that antagonist protein which you were trying to, to get um, and other anti-inflammatory cytokines. Um, so what you're getting is a very uh, uh, decent amount of anti-inflammatory mechanism as opposed to what you see in the ACP, uh, which is obviously um, a blood sample that contains an anticoagulant and has not clotted. What we realize is that the clot and the stress that you place on the cells within the clot is an actual vital component uh, of that. Um, if we look on the other side, um, growth factors, uh, PDGF and TGF beta. What's interesting is that um, I'll touch on when we start talking about uh, PRP. Um, TGF beta is actually pro IL1, so we're starting to get um, some factors that could actually influence um, a inflammatory situation or adversely affect an adverse situation. So I'm going to close there. I don't want to talk too much more about that, but other than ACS and ACP are not the same. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that they are. They're very, very different in their makeup. That's not to say that you won't use an ACP. ACP has its advantages and very much as it shows already in that slide, uh, the, the growth factors that are in it. Um, but I wouldn't be using ACP for the application of uh, the, the generating interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein. So ACS in canine, it has been used in human and equine for a phenomenal amount of time um, over several years. I mean, probably more than 10 years that I know that's been used in, in equine and human uh, um, uh, disease uh, treatment. But really it started to come now into uh, the, the canine, the small animal setting. I would have to say, if we go back, um, we do like seeing ACS used in the acute stage of the disease, but all too often what we see is when a technology comes out in its, in its, its, its new form or applied in a new setting, it tends to be used in the, uh, the, the refractory, the, the, the hopeless cases. I don't know why we do that because we're kind of lining ourselves up for a fall when we, we kind of reach out for whatever's left. Oh, we've got something new. Let's use it in this worst case and expect a miracle to happen where actually we should be in the canine setting, look to see where it's been used in human and in equine and apply the same process. However, this is a, a paper out of Germany a few years ago. It's a small group of patients, but it's really good at demonstrating that even in the advanced stage of the disease, um, we've got elbow and obviously stifle disease here, uh, demonstrated by the radiographs, is that we're still able to reduce the overall pain and lameness score of these patients um, within a relatively short period of time, within two weeks, and then increasing its uh, efficacy over several more weeks. And this ran out for 12 weeks. But it's just a demonstration of how this, this uh, particular antagonist protein has the ability to block the inflammatory reaction of interleukin-1, even in a fairly advanced disease process. Um, so it just gives you an example of how that works in the canine joint. Tips and tricks when it comes to producing it. Okay, when it comes to the equine patient, really both equine and canine, is keep your treatment interval seven days apart. So it's once a week. In equine, that's pretty standard now. Why? Because we now understand that, that cycle, that 14 day cycle. So you're trying to have enough protein on board within the joint to block it as that IL1 cycles through 
its peak cycle points. So if you can do that, then you're ahead. If you to do it every 14 days, you might be at the opposite end where you're getting a peak, but you've got no protein. That's because these proteins have a half-life, um, which is less than the obviously the, the seven day duration. Um, so just making sure that you've got enough on board is what you're going to get out of making sure that you can block at a particular time um, or at least um, replace what the joint isn't doing as far as enough IL-1 RA on board to ensure that you can balance that wave again. <clears throat> K9, I understand that this is going to be a little bit more difficult because the application of a joint injection every seven days isn't really what the small animal patient um, is lined up for. It's not something we do routinely, but I do urge if you are going to use ACS in a case which you can't use, non steroidals you're trying to get the inflammation under control in the joint then absolutely you want to be doing it every seven days perhaps you know two or three injections would be the best um, but two is better than one that's all i would say um, i'm often asked if ha antibiotics can be used at the same time no uh, just stick to using your your acs um, be very gentle with the syringes when you're actually producing it um, what i tend to to say is that don't ship the blood to a laboratory for acs ship the patient to a practice that has ACS capability. Um, and that's really because what I want to see is the blood taken. And especially when it comes to ACS, you'll get that clot straight away. And the time starts from your draw of the blood. So the hours is really important. So if you're using the small syringes in canine or using the large syringes in equine, the small syringes, we tend to stick to about six to seven hours. The, the large syringes is a 24 hour syringe. So what I'm looking at there is the point that you draw it, you need to write the time on the syringe so that anybody who's processing it can then obviously process it for the term and time. So if we were shipping it or driving it, then that, that 24 hour window tends to be overlooked. Um, and that's down to the manufacturing um, recommendations on those timings to get the best results. So if you are outside of those hours, you really don't know what results that you might get. Okay. Now turning our attention to platelet-rich plasma. Um, this has gained in popularity over the years um, because it's quick and easy. I think it's used um, way more in equine now than, um, than any other, say um, a small animal application or, or even human, I would say. Um, it started to gain popularity in human, but it's not in um, mainstream use for uh, joint or, or tendon or ligament disease. I'd say it's still very much used as an elite treatment for sport people or, or private medicine. Um, whereas what we see with, with the equine use of platelet-rich plasma, it's a very quick and easy patient side application for stimulating repair. Okay, and that's what it's all about, it's about stimulating. Um, and there are several publications, I'm, I've not gone into all the publications there. Um, this is one that's quite old now, actually it goes back to, um, uh, yeah, nearly 10 years old, so 2010, uh, where this was when Gurkha Bosch was at Utrecht University and he was looking at how PRP uh, was applied to the equine uh, SDFT. And um, this is the one that uh, also looked at the UTC um, scan system by uh, Hans Van Schie. So they had a bit of a, an experience of looking at the quality of the repair. So this is quite a good paper to look at as well. Though it's old, but it's quite a good paper to read. Uh, PRP in canine joint disease, that's really where it's being used. That's not to say it can't be used in tendon ligament injuries as well, but we tend to find that it's being used predominantly in the canine OA setting. So there are a few papers out. This is quite a nice one. Uh, again, it's a few years old now, back in 2013. But what you get here is it's a, it's a small group of dogs over a relatively small amount of time, but 12 weeks. But it was enough to actually show that the majority of the dogs actually had a beneficial outcome. So their overall lameness and painless scores were reduced quite a lot, now almost by 50%. That's quite a reduction in pain and lameness scores uh, within a relatively short period of time, having had their PRP inject from the joint. So it goes to show, and these were just PRPs, um, so these, these dogs were not in any other treatment. So it had a benefit, it had a clinical benefit to injecting the joint that was associated with that pain um, with PRP. So to understand PRP, you've got to take it another step forward. And I think in tissue engineering and understanding tissue engineering, if you can get your head into the growth factors, and that's the thing, it's got really 
go beyond the platelet and it's got very little to do with the, the, the plasma. In fact, some uh, platelet uh, technologies actually don't even have any plasma. And some of the results, especially the one that was in the canine study, that was from a platelet enrichment therapy. Um, it's called the VPET. And that actually uses a filtration method of harvesting platelets and putting it back into a saline solution. So there's no plasma at all. So that's not even a PRP. It's the platelet. Now, what is it about the platelet that we're trying to achieve? It's the growth factors. Those growth factors are stimulatory. Okay, so you're going to stimulate a response where you put that PRP. But a couple of words of caution. So some of my favorites, and these aren't just limited to the, the PR, uh, sorry, the growth factors within PRP. So PDGF, platelet derived growth factor, it is profibrogenic. You've got to take that on board and it is a growth factor that is dominant over all the other growth factors. So you're gonna be careful where you're using PRP because it could potentiate the formation of a fibrotic repair. Now, Gurko's paper didn't see that and a lot of other publications didn't see that. So I do take a step back. It's not gonna create it, but PDGF is, you know, its role in life is fibrogenesis. So you've gotta understand the stimulation towards it. However, it does also involve the regulation and secretion of collagen synthesis. So it's got some other factors to it. TGF beta, transforming growth factor beta, there's two isoforms, one and two. Uh, one's pro and one's anti scarring So I guess these just shout at each other all day. Um, but it's a fantastic growth factor to, to, to work with and to, to monitor and, and see how this, this growth factor actually works when you apply PRP. But for me, the big thing about TGF beta is its upregulation of chemokines and chemotaxis. So this has the ability just to wake everything up. And the nice thing about chemotaxis is we get this influx of other healing cells, especially pericytes or, or, or cells that are responsible for stimulating repair come in. So whilst we say that PRP is only stimulatory, it can stimulate a modulatory response because of the other cells that it attracts through that upregulation of chemotaxis. When we're looking at a chronic disease, so we're looking at, at uh, uh, ligamentous injuries um, that may be gone on for a period of time or any other soft tissue injury where chemotaxis becomes downregulated, especially after three months, then TGF beta has got a really nice way of waking everything back up again. And that's where you're going to be using it. VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Again, one of my little favorites because we get to encourage angiogenesis. So if I'm encouraging chemotaxis, I'm encouraging angiogenesis, especially an area that's got poor blood supply to it. Um, and I'm essentially promoting a little bit of, uh, you know, with, with PDGF, I wouldn't say a fibrous repair, but a tissue repair. You can start to see how these growth factors start to overlap their stimulatory response with healing tissue. What I would say about PRP and uh, my analogy here is it's a little bit like watching seven year old boys play football. Okay. Um, very enthusiastic but no really control factor, okay? It's not modulatory. So you don't really have a huge amount of control over the tissue that's gonna be formed. These growth factors will stimulate their, their own. And this is where concentrations of growth factors to reach a end result are unknown, okay? We talk about a fourfold over baseline um, being the therapeutic uh, level. Um, so most people don't even know what the baseline should be, um, but really, uh, for horses and dogs, we're looking at about 250,000 platelets per microliter would be your baseline normal. So we're looking at a million platelets per microliter. But I can tell you now, most people don't check. So they would manufacture their PRP and just go with it. Very rarely have I seen a practice take a sample and check base over amplification to see if they needed to alter it. Now, for the more advanced practices, you'll get a situation where they would manipulate the final concentration based on what they were getting, especially if they understood what that baseline was as far as their platelet fraction and the amount of fluid that you would uh, resuspend the platelet fraction in if you're using a centrifugation model. Okay, PRP is a scaffold. It's very, very versatile. Um, certainly I've been involved where we have worked with um, either applying it in a scaffold or even activating it. So um, this picture here is actually me messing around in the laboratory where I've got the PRP and I've actually stimulated and activated it with autologous thrombin. 
So I've actually been able to get the uh, thrombin out of the blood, turn it around and stimulate the PRP to give me this really nice scaffold as such. It, it does look like a bit of a tongue sweet. You know, those red tongue sweets the kids eat. Um, I wouldn't advise producing it for that. Um, but it is, it's, it's manageable. You can actually pick it up, you can apply it. So this is what we've used in really nasty wounds, non-healing wounds, just to stimulate a repair. Because what's gonna happen is that this scaffold here, this, this clot factor of growth factors, is it's now going to shed those off in a controlled fashion. So rather than just getting a one big hit, we just get these nice release. So what I like about that is, um, Things like VEGF and uh, TGF beta. I'm going to increase my blood supply. I'm going to increase my uh, my chemotaxis. I'm going to potentially speed up or stimulate epithelialization. So I really like that in wounds. Uh, the image on the bottom here is actually it being applied in some caudal cyst, almost like a layering effect, where we're kind of using a autograph and a PRP gelling. Again, that was done with thrombin. So we're getting a sort of a sandwich, just uh, almost acting as a plug almost for the graft that's going in there. So again, PRP is very versatile. I know it's used in dentistry in human. Um, it's actually used in dentistry in small animals, but predominantly in, in the States where they're putting it into periodontal pockets to accelerate soft tissue growth. Um, Non-union fractures seems to be an area where it's quite popular in, um, in, in human medicine and really anywhere where you're trying to stimulate a tissue growth. Uh, my word of warning is that all PRPs are equal. There's a lot of PRP systems on the markets who do not believe the hype or the sales rep. Do your own homework. There are a few leading manufacturers out there and they've been around for quite some time. Um, there's obviously the Harvest system. There is the companion CRT system. That's been very well validated in the small animal arena. And we have this patient side system by Paul Corporation. This has been out for about 16, 17 years now. It found its way into the market in equine and now is used as much in small animal. They both have their pros and cons. And really what we're looking at here is the ability to produce a, uh, first of all, a concentration factor. So you've got the growth factor concentrations here. So the CRT does, and this is in, in canine, this is a paper that was produced by Sherman Canap a few years ago. And what they're looking at here is your robust ability to produce a, a, a good therapeutic dose of the, uh, the growth factor concentration. And I think, yeah, so I go back a slide. What this paper also talks about is that um, you've got to look at a, at least a fourfold um, increase. Um, it's really about removing red cells because red cells are deleterious to synoviocytes. Uh, they tend to react and also the white cells. So we, we don't really need the white cells then. I know some of you will now be shouting at the screen um, there are some groups that actually say that the white cells could be beneficial. Um, and I think the jury is still out on whether or not we think they're beneficial or not beneficial. For me, if I want the stimulation of a growth factor, that's what I want. I don't want to uh, think about what other cells might be playing a part in. Um, so really I want to try and get as a pure of a growth factor preparation as I can. So for your systems, you need to be looking, like I said, uh, a system that produces a consistent high uh, growth factor concentration, low red cell and white cell contamination. So my tips and tricks when it comes to PRP here is, um, I've already talked about, do I need to worry about the concentration? You do, and I do urge people to do pre and post uh, checks on this. Do I need to worry about the white cells? I'll leave that to the individual. For me, I'm not overly concerned with the white cell contamination. I prefer a PRP preparation without it. And I know some people do freeze PRP. Um, again, there's some thoughts about the, uh, the, the freeze thaw process, but what we're looking at here is if you were to freeze the PRP, then obviously that would lice the white cell. So, you know, whether it's good or bad, the white cell is taken out of the equation uh, through the freeze thaw process. Um, but if you are gonna go through it, we have got a paper uh, online. Uh, this is on Uppsala.com. Uh, you can actually go in and, and look at this as a procedure. And what we have here is how you would thaw it, but you are really encouraged to clean it. So um, if you are going to freeze it, then you're going to pass it through a 0.2 micron filter to clean the, the debris, the lice cells from the freeze process. But what you will get is a protein solution the other side. It's a growth factor protein solution the other side because your platelet will become activated in that freeze thaw process as well. 
Moving up the scale, we now have bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And I'm going to say here, it doesn't really matter if it's a bone marrow aspirate concentrate, a adipose nucleated cell fraction, or even what we're seeing now with the, the launch of um, Articell 40 on the market by Boehringer of a um, autologous, uh, sorry, an allogeneic cell, sorry, the Articell 40 is an allogeneic cell, is that we're now starting to apply cells. So these cells we understand, and we've kind of gone through all sorts of rigmarole of what we're gonna call them. Are they stem cells? Are they progenitor cells? The, the latest um, way that we understand them now, there are pericytes. Um, I, I get that and I understand how, especially when we look at things like adipose tissue, where we are actually getting um, vascular adipose because that's where the pericytes are. They're not actually in the fat, they're attached to the vessels. And pericytes, as you know, they upregulate paracrine function. And that's essentially what you're trying to do. Paracrine function is a controlling mechanism. It's a modulating control mechanism. So we're using these cells to modulate control. And again, I'm one for my allergies and, uh, and uh, allergies, an allergy, sorry, I'm not that bad. Um, so what I said to a group I was lecturing to a little while ago was, if I, if I ran out onto the beach and said tsunami is coming, okay, and I was taken out by that wave, I can guarantee you my message would carry on going. So one of the problems that we've got with the application of cells is that we know that the cell doesn't last very long, okay? Uh, in certain circumstances, and there's been quite a few papers published now showing that most of the stem cells or progenitor cells or parasites that you inject into tissue are dead within a very short amount of time. But that signal that they produce when they go into that environment, these cells read the environment. Okay? They understand if it's an inflammatory environment, they understand what tissue that they're in, and they will modulate accordingly. And that signal that they push out and typically they use proteins, these, these uh, cells have the ability to produce proteins, they live on, okay? And that's where we get in this repair mechanism. So we're now looking at the application of a modulator. It is the conductor, okay? So what we've got is someone who's actually telling the cells what to do. Um, and the amount that you apply. So for those on the small animal side, you're probably wondering what that is. The equine lot know exactly what this is. Uh, this is a cross section of a horse's tendon. So here we've got the superficial flexor tendon with obviously damage uh, within the core of it. And what we're trying to do with the, uh, the application of uh, Bomer aspirate concentrate is it's a lower number of cells that one could apply without having to culture. So we're starting to look at where do we cross between the time it takes the culture versus getting a cell in that's going to help modulate repair. Uh, and again, it goes back to our clinical strategy of not wanting a fibrous repair. Um, PRP versus BMAC, this is asked of me all the time. Um, when we started using PRP years and years ago, um, we were always a little bit worried about its potential to create a fibrous repair, um, which is obviously something which the tendon is gonna do in itself. So the last thing we wanna do is push it down that line. I know, again, go back to Gerko Bosch's paper and a couple other papers, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that fibrous repair that we were worried about before. However, when I look at PRP versus BMAC, what I'm going to look at here is PDGF. Again, in PRP, it's relatively high. Why? Because that's what it is. It's platelet-derived growth factor. It is fibrogenic, and it is quite a lot more than our marrow uh, counterpart here. TGF beta 1, again, I talked to you about the two isoforms, one and two, one's pro scarring, one's anti scarring. TGF beta 1 is pro scarring. In PRP, it's higher than in marrow. So in PRP, I've got two factors here that are a little bit higher than marrow that are fibrogenically stimulated. I'm not saying that's deleterious all the time, but it's a word of caution. There are other growth factors in bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And if you're using a, a PRP fraction to put your adipose cells back into whatever you're, you're looking at, there's probably growth factors in that. So when I'm looking at the use of BMAC, I'm looking at the size of the lesion in the tendon and the ability to add a conductor or modulator to help drive the tissue down the right pathway. Okay, so that's where we start to change tactic and go up a slide. Okay, switching back to dog a second. This is the efficacy and, and, and uh, demonstration of how a BMAC or a cell fraction works within the canine setting. 
Um, some really good work here by Sherman Knapp, and uh, he's at a, a practice in the States in Washington, the VOSM, uh, the Veterinary um, Orthopedic Sports uh, Medicine Clinic. Um, and he's been instrumental in driving forward, especially in the US small animal market, the use of biologics. And I think he was probably one of the pioneers uh, in this. And this is a particular paper, again, a really good read. And what's quite nice is that he's picked a soft tissue injury. Uh, this is the cranial cruciate ligament tear, and it's a tear that's less than 50%, okay? This is diagnosed by him using the, uh, the insight needle scope. He's gone into the joint, um, uh, looked at the, the tear in the ligament, and ascertained that it is less than 50%, okay? Um, so we often get asked about, well, if I haven't got the ability to scope the joint, how do I know if this particular tear could be less than 50%? What we're saying, and it's a very crude um, way of looking at this, is if we've got all the signs and symptoms of stifle um, pathology, we've got that, that joint effusion, um, it's quite painful, but we haven't got any instability, we've got no cranial draw, and it is, you know, it uh, stays over for quite some time, we've got the symptoms for quite some time over, you know, a couple of months, for instance, then we know we've got damage or soft tissue damage. We can't say that it is the cranial crucial ligament, or we know that it is a soft tissue damage potentially. Um, and if it is soft tissue, then it would lend itself to this type of treatment. But that is a fairly crude way to look at it. But let's go back to what Sherman looked at here. He was able to scope the joint, see the, uh, the tear in the tendon, and delivered a cell fraction, whether it was bone marrow or adipose. Um, he did a, a selection of uh, both systems. Um, and obviously resuspended those cells either in the supernatant or in PRP and applied it as a intraarticular injection again through the needle scope and he was able to use the needle scope and go back and recheck these and what you've got is nine of these 13 dogs had a fully intact CCL they did not need surgery so that's a, a huge achievement a leap forward in the management of this disease by using a biologic Stem cells in dogs, they've been around for a long time. Uh, this is some work taken from a US company, Vet Stem, out in the States, and they use the adipose uh, nucleated cell fraction. Uh, there's two or three laboratories, I'd probably say three laboratories here in the UK, uh, or main uh, laboratories here in the UK, that actually produce cells for canine OA use. Um, and you've got one in Scotland, one in um, Warwickshire, I think it's Warwickshire, Oxfordshire area. Now I know both of those labs are VMD approved and what they do is they take adipose and essentially what you're doing is digesting out or breaking down the tissue to release those pericytes and they are harvested and turned around quite rapidly. So they're either amplified and you can take that fraction and grow by allowing the cells to adhere to tissue culture, uh, plastic and grow up or they turn them around as a nucleated cell fraction. And there's quite a bit of data out there now supporting its use in OA. How does it work? Goes back to these cells reading the environment. The, the cell that you actually create or, or, or amplify or even take out of the, uh, the cell fraction, call them mesenchymal stem cells, progenitor cells, parasites, whatever you want to call them, uh, they're pretty much all the same label these days, is that these cells can read the environment, especially in inflamed environment, and can produce, wait for it, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein, which is great. So we're getting an anti-inflammatory effect. These cells are very, very capable of producing an anti-inflammatory effect. So you get this almost immediate cessation of the pain associated with inflammation within the joint using a natural cell. And there seems to be a degree of longevity to this application. Now that might be just purely the ability to decrease that wave and the amount of IL-1 array produced by these cells rather than doing it the ACS method by trying to torture the leukocyte and get it to produce is that these cells are administered into the joint, read the environment and go about reducing the inflammatory situation. I'd say if it was the acute stage of the disease, then we've probably got a little bit of modulating and stimulating going on to the repair of soft tissues. I think it was the end stage disease where this is used. It's just a very good biological anti-inflammatory, but your ability to break that wave can last for several months. And that's what we find with, uh, with results that are coming out by laboratories and practices that use stem cells in the application of osteoarthritis in dogs. Um, again, another paper by Sherman Knapp. This is a supraspinatus tendinopathy. I urge any of these small animal clinicians 
um, to grab an ultrasound machine, start looking at these soft tissue structures. Um, and uh, I've certainly urged uh, practices that have got a small animal and a large animal department, get together, get the equine clinician to teach the small animal clinicians how to read MSK ultrasound. Because these guys do it day in, day out. Plan a 30 minute session in practice, get a dog and start scanning it because scanning comes down to practice and knowing what you're looking for. And what we're seeing is these, these shoulder lamenesses, is that supraspinatus, there's a lesion in it and go back to our equine work. If there's a lesion, there's pain. If there's pain, there's pathology. What are we gonna do about it? You can inject it. We can inject these canine supraspinatus tendinopathies and they respond really, really well. Now, to, to a lot of the population that read this, the small animal population that read this, this was revelationary. What I'd say is over on the, the uh, large animal side of things, and even to the human to extent, it wasn't that revelationary because we've been doing it for years. And, and why would it not work? Because we've seen intralesional tendon uh, injuries um, respond very well to biologics. So the results, ironically, that um, Sherman came out with, um, we're looking at above 80% success rate on injecting these tendon uh, pathologies um, with a biologic such as a bone aspirate concentrate or a, a nucleated cell fraction from adipose. So just a, an interesting one there. There is reason to get into MSK ultrasound if you're not there yet in a small animal practice. So the tips and tricks when it comes to harvesting bone marrow from the, uh, the equine patient. Yes, yeah, sternum versus tubercoxy. Now, there's a lot of thought about the, uh, the deleterious or, or, or dangerous uh, situation about removing bone marrow from the sternum. Um, here at Nupsala, we do have a training program. If you haven't done it before, get one of our Nupsala vets to come out to your practice, or even I think we're gonna do a tutorial on harvesting bone marrow during this time when we've all got a little bit of time on our hands. Um, so that you can understand a very safe way of removing bone marrow from the sternum, or there is the tubercoxy. Um, what I would say is when you understand the difference between the two, the sternum is a very straightforward, and I'd say actually a very safe procedure if you know what you're doing. First, the tubercoxy, yes, you can remove bone marrow from the tubercoxy, from the pelvis, but it's very, very hard. Um, when I say hard is you better have had your Weetabix that morning. You've got a lot of cortical bone to get through before you're actually into a position where you can draw bone marrow. So it is achievable, and interestingly, uh, there is a paper that actually shows that bone marrow aspiration from the, uh, the sternum actually yields a bit of a better uh, uh, cell um, collection than via the uh, tubercoxy. Um, when we're injecting tendons, this is often a bit of a, an unknown. How much do you inject? Now, really doesn't come to uh, uh, not much to think about when we're injecting a joint or a tendon. The cells or the platelets or the proteins that you're injecting don't have to be in a huge amount of volume. Okay, they do disperse very easily and the, uh, the, the sort of the, the ripple effect that they have um, can go a lot further than you think. So what you don't want to do, whether it's a tendon or a joint, don't, don't get into the trap of trying to put more in. You want to, yes, put more cells in or more, more, more platelets in, but don't put more volume in. Okay, because that's either going to distend the joint or it's going to distend the tendon, um, which in itself is going to be... Uh, deleterious and what you don't want to do. You want to cause more reaction. So think about the volume as your carrier. It's the bus carrying. Um, so reduce that amount. And you do, certainly when injecting a tendon, do not inject more than your point of resistance. Okay, so you get to point of resistance, stop. Okay. Another little tip and trick when it comes to injecting tendons is, um, and I'll probably do a, a tutorial on this uh, later in the week, is when you're injecting, leave a small amount of air in the hub of your needle very, very small amounts, so it's not going to cause a problem, is that you're going to see it on ultrasound. So you get to see where you're injecting it. Now that find might sound quite um, routine for a uh, equine clinician. Small animal clinicians start to inject tendons at the first time is a small amount of air when it comes out, that's where you're about to inject. Okay, so watch for it. Because if you're not there and you're guessing where your needle is, that little burst of air, if it's in the wrong place, stop pull out, start again, reassess the situation. So use that as your positive indicator where you are, especially in a soft tissue structure. To help visualize, and this is a real quick and easy one, um, there are special needles, by the way. Um, so the, uh, the ultrasound companies will probably be phoning me when they see this released, um, saying they've got these special needles, we've done this. 
However, I quite like the scratch the needle approach. Um, I've shown this many, many years ago um, uh, by a, a Swiss uh, a surgeon and it, it's very easy. You get your, your needle that you're going to use and you get a scalpel blade and you score down the needle. And what you're actually doing is that you're scoring into it. You're not going to get metal shards or anything. Um, and to, to avoid that, it's a sort of cause I have it. I always end up just wiping the needle with a sterile swab afterwards to try and pick anything. And I've looked at a microscope and there's never ever been anything there. But when you're scoring that needle and do it quite vigorously, is that you're creating indentations in the, uh, the actual surface of the needle, which picks up the ultrasound. And uh, especially if you're new to doing intralesional or uh, intertendinous or interligamentous uh, injections, just watching it go in just gives you a little bit more confidence that you're in the right place. Okay, when it comes to stem cells, um, gosh, I need to really update this slide. Um, it's actually 19 years. Um, we were, uh, I was working with Roger Smith many, many years ago. Um, and I have to say, and I like this opportunity now um, to, to uh, really thank Roger for the opportunity I had working with him many years ago. And I certainly wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for everything that Roger taught me and the opportunity that he gave me many years ago. Um, and he still is absolutely um, a, a, an innovator in this, this area. And I, I think we all owe Roger a debt of gratitude to the amount of work that he's into um, advancing how we approach uh, tendon ligament um, uh, injuries uh, clinically. So let's look at stem cell process. I think a lot of the equine lot will know this slide. Um, it's been around for quite some time. We take the stem cells either from the sternum, the tuber coxae, or from the adipose, I don't really mind what. It's sent to the laboratory. Um, for us, we use BioBest Laboratory. There are other laboratories and other registered laboratories available. Um, and uh, we've got a talk coming up this week from the Chief Executive of uh, BioBest, Paul Burr, who's going to talk you through what you should expect from your stem cell laboratory. And what we do is we go through a culture process and we get to a number that we believe to be therapeutic and that is sent back for injecting back into the patient. This is the autologous process. Obviously the allogeneic cells that are now available, um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I may pick up another tutorial where I'll talk about those, is that obviously they're off the shelf. Um, it's allogeneic, you get it from uh, bow ringer and uh, there you go, ampular cells ready to go straight away. Um, the harvesting of um, material, switching back to the dog now, we talked about the harvesting of bone marrow from uh, the, uh, the horse. Um, if people are interested, I could go through a tutorial on how to harvest fat from the horse. We take it from the tail head. It's a fairly simple procedure. But really what we're looking at here from the dog is how to harvest adipose tissue for cell fraction. And for me, the, the most ideal place is right just behind the scapula. If you get the, the, the leg and bring the elbow up, you kind of feel the, uh, the fat pad here that's just behind it. And I like it because it's an area that the dog can't get to. Um, so... Um, in fact, most situations, just one incision is enough to harvest enough fat. Um, and it's a, a very sort of um, easy area to harvest it from. There's not too many complications the dog can get to. It's certainly not an area that they're going to lick or bite or chew um, and recover very easily from it. And uh, a rule of thumb, pardon the pun, is you want about a thumb. So you want about a thumb's mass worth of adipose tissue. And the word here is it's got to be vascular adipose tissue. You want it to be a little bit bloody. You don't want it to be opaque and not really vascular. And again, that goes down to our knowledge of the cells acting or sitting as parasites on the vessels because we strip those cells away from the vessels. That's what gives rise to our nucleated cell fraction. Harvesting bone marrow from the dog. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Um, um, obviously, you, you can use the humerus. This is the, uh, the technique of harvesting it from the humerus. Um, but I think most of the clinicians that I work with that, that harvest bone marrow from, uh, from dogs for, for use in biologics tend to now just go for the hip. Um, so there is a procedure in our guidebook on how to harvest it from the hip. Really, all you're trying to do is get into that cavity and remove the bone marrow. And a tip and trick here, and just to help people understand, if you're used to the application of interosseous needles for interosseous fluid or you have an interosseous kit, the application of putting fluid into uh, the, uh, the bone is also the removal of it. So don't overcomplicate this. If you can do that, then you can remove bone marrow. Okay, flicking back, and, and I, I don't really make any apologies because I want the small animal and the equine lot to kind of work at the same speed, understanding 
how to use um, biologics. So this is data on the use of stem cells in uh, uh, a population of, um, of uh, performance horses. This is Roger Smith's data um, and it looked at um, uh, certain papers which were produced by Sue Dyson um, and Amira when we looked at uh, conventional therapy versus the, the stem cell. Um, what I would say is um, get into reading it. There's lots of ways you can read it, but really the net result out of this is that we ended up showing a beneficial outcome to the horses that were treated with stem cells and monitored over a period of time. Um, and I can't really do this presentation justice or this paper justice. Um, I would urge if Roger's out giving this talk or you see him giving this talk again, get into it because it really is still the gold standard for tendon injuries. And you go back and understand how Roger approached this particular project and the end results. Okay, I think I've touched on this. This is very much what it was with the BMAC, uh, but the same applies to if you're using stem cells as to where you harvest your material from the tip and tricks on that side of things. Um, something that's fairly new now, I was at AEP last year and there was a great uh, presentation on this. I'm gonna see if I can get um, the, uh, the presenter to present as a small tutorial for us. And this is the ability to use cells um, via intra-arterial, okay? Um, so what we're looking at here is the cell's ability to um, obviously migrate chemotactically and take up residence in damaged tissue. So for the horse, we're looking at the distal limb, we're looking at deep flexor tears, that sort of thing, which are really hard. So it's Colorado, so there's some great work coming out of Colorado, and um, they've done a fair amount now. Now there was some worry when this procedure first came out that it was, it was quite a difficult one, and obviously using the medium artery, um, that it carried a different, uh, or sorry, a potential problem if, if you were to obviously create damage to that artery. Um, but the guys presenting AAP, they've got some really good tips and tricks on how to avoid that. And really when it comes to the type of pathology that they were treating, um, the prognosis if they don't treat is obviously very poor. So if you take that on board with the, uh, the potential hazard and apply it, there's some really good work coming out now. So that's new. So this is an area to follow. I haven't seen anybody in the UK. I don't know if anybody in Europe is doing this technique, but the guys in the States are obviously doing a lot more of it. Okay, and the last area to, to, to touch on is polyacrylamide hydrogel. It's not really a biologic, but it does involve tissue engineering. I'm just gonna cut through a few slides because we are having a few talks on this as the weeks go on. Um, what is it? It's a new scaffold that's out. It's the 2.5% cross-linked polyacrylamide. It is nothing more than a scaffold, okay? It's not a cushion. It's not a visco supplementation. It is a scaffold. Why do we want a scaffold? We want a scaffold, if I take you right back to the problems that we had with the joint and interleukin-1 and the damage to the synovia sites, and in particular the damage that you see to the beta intima cells and the intima being damaged, this supplies a scaffold, okay, to help the intima layer recover, okay? The first thing it's gonna be doing is it's gonna be displacing joint fluid, which obviously um, slows down healing, and then provide a scaffold for these cells to grow into. Um, so in the talks that we're going to give in the next couple of weeks, you're going to understand how that gel is adsorbed, not absorbed, through cell migration, through it, how cells take up residence in it. It's permanent, and that's that scaffold. Um, it's got quite a lot of longevity to it um, and some really good um, proven efficacy. Again, we're going to go through this in more depth over a couple of talks in the next couple of weeks, so watch out for that during uh, the next couple of weeks. So... What we saw with these publications was the ability to administer something that could last up to two years. We've seen, certainly seen it in the human setting, um, what we're seeing now in the equine setting, and this has been um, also verified through a retrospective um, um, analysis of, and I've got a talk on this coming up, is uh, 360 horses, 800 joints. If you haven't seen that talk and you're watching this talk first, I'd urge you to now go and watch that talk, especially an equine clinician, because it talks about in practice over several years, does this have the same result? So these are fairly small groups, typical type of clinical study where you take a small group and, and monitor them. Um, and the, um, the question is always asked, is this true in normal clinical setting? So the retrospective study, which you can go and watch this talk, takes three practices over several years, and guess what? 
it does do exactly what they thought it was going to. So the vast majority, nearly 70% of the cases that we saw in the retrospective study do have that two year longevity to the efficacy of this gel used to assist soft tissue recovery to osteoarthritis, which makes it a disease modifier. Um, pushing past that case study, that's something we're going to uh, look at later on. It was a video and I know that's not gonna load right now, but I'll come back to that later on. Um, we did come up with this guide for the treatment of canine arthritis. Again, this is downloadable or available through the VOA. Um, this is small animal, not uh, for equine. So it allows you as a small animal clinician to grade and understand really what you are seeing, um, your treatment options and what your strategy might be with applying that treatment outcome. And again, as that disease progresses and it destabilizes, then you might need to review your treatment strategy and apply a different biological to achieve the outcome. Flicking back to equine, when we're using the biologics here, and again, this could be seen very similar when you're then carrying this over to small animal use. When would I use a PRP versus a BMAC and stem cells? If I focus on where we saw the results using stem cells, post inflammation round about the day that we were getting the, uh, the bone marrow, um, we needed about 20 days to grow these cells up. It takes two to three weeks to grow the cells. What we found was that the results that were applied after 28 days were starting to drop off and that was just through experience. So we advise anybody who's going to use culture stem cells to be able to inject them between 21 and 28 days. Regardless of the amount of damage, you need to aim off 21 to 28 days post inflammatory phase. If you can't do that, then you've got to switch tactic and go for perhaps a BMAC or a PRP. Again, if it's past that point of time, it's past 28 days, you're gonna be using a BMAC or a PRP. There's no even point in taking the bone marrow for culture or the adipose for culture. If it's a minor injury, then you could be using PRP just to stimulate the healing process, just to get it on, removing that inflammatory environment and just getting it from a catabolic to an anabolic. And there's certainly enough with the papers produced right now, especially with a small injury, you're not gonna run the risk of driving it down a fibrotic type repair, which is what you're trying to avoid. So there we are, ladies and gents. Hopefully that uh, extended tutorial uh, will take you through that biologics are not the same, understand which to use at particular times. Timing is absolutely critical and what you should expect from it. Getting that balance right. So try to put yourself in a situation where you might think that, do I do a second injection? If it's an inflamed environment or it's a very acute environment, maybe going back in two to three weeks time to seeing how the tissue has responded or the joint has responded and be prepared to inject again to further stimulate or to further drive um, that uh, modulatory anabolic status. Okay, and again, look at patient to patient, treat each patient as they come and understand that variations do occur in biologics. Hope you found that useful. There's a lot more talks uh, like this in Nutsala Learning and please send us your information or feedback. I'm more than happy to take questions on this or I can take any individual part of this and break it out into a longer seminar uh, if that's what you want. So thank you for listening, thank you for watching and tune into the next uh, seminar from Salomon.